Okay, I'm just. <laughs> Good evening, just ladies and gentlemen. Okay. <laughs> and welcome to the. What is it? September 12th. Oh, happy birthday to my brother. Meeting of the Blackstone Millville Regional S District School Committee. Uh, please join me and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, we will start our meeting with our introduction of, of members, and Sarah, we'll start at your side. I'm Cassandra. I'm Vice President of Student Council. Sarah Williams, Blackstone. Jack Keefe, Blackstone. Are we coming this way? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Hi, I'm Jacob Chaplin. I'm the President of Student Council. Wendy Greenstein, Blackstone. Tammy Lemieux, Blackstone. Tara Larkin, Millville. Erin Panarco, Millville. And I'm Jane Reggio from Millville. Matt Aaronworth, Assistant Superintendent. Jason DeFalco, Superintendent. And a special welcome to Jacob and Cassandra. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Congratulations on your positions, and we're thrilled to have you with us um, here at our meetings. And we usually start with, with you guys to tell us what's going on in the world, what um, is wonderful that's happening at BMR and how we can help you make it even better. Want to go first? Sure. So for sports, um, our football started off their season with a first win. Field hockey has one win. Girls and boys soccer both one win. Volleyball a win. And band received the highest scoring of the entire competition coming in first place over the weekend. Um, and for me, I have like updates on like the leadership organizations at BMR. So the BMR Student Council has had a very busy summer. We had one delegate attend the National Leadership Conference in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. And we also had four delegates at the Summer Leadership Conference at Worcester State. Um, freshman orientation this year was an incredible success this year. Our goal was to create an open and accepting environment for the freshmen and to provide them with students that they could go to um, as upperclassmen when they needed help. And I feel like we accomplished that. A lot of the freshmen said we did. Um, our first Stuka meeting was last night, and our council has seemingly doubled in membership from last year to this year, which is incredible, and we have a full year planned for events for that. NHS this year has a large number of students as well that are participating, largest it has been in a while, and um, they have a full schedule for the food pantry, and other committees are being set up as we speak to, for further events for our community. And finally, um, for the first year, I think like a decade for our school, we have um, student represent representation at the Regional Student Advisory Council for the Board of Education and the State Student Advisory Council for the Board of Education. We have two delegates at Regional and one delegate at the State Advisory Council and the delegate at the State Advisory Council has also been elected as Vice Chair of the State, State mm -hmm. Advisory Council for the Board wow. of Education. Wow. Wow. Through that they go... Th um, Who is that? Who is that? Me. No. <laughs> no. Oh. Wow! <laughs> So how you pretend it's this third person yeah, that you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, through that. Congratulations to that person. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, through that at regionals, um, we participate and do things as a regional to participate with other schools that are around us that are experiencing the same issues. And at state, we work through more broader issues in Malden six times a year. Wow. Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. So you can tell us everything going on. <laughs> That's awesome. Anybody have any questions for... Cassandra or Jacob? Go ahead. Are you both seniors? Yes. yes. So how many more days till graduation? Uh, 151. Oh. Woo! <laughs> to know that yet. <laughs> All right. It's been a long time since we've had somebody who could answer that question. That's great, too. Yeah, I don't know right. how to interpret that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's exciting and they're a good thing. Steps. That's right. Planning. That's right. <laughs> So speaking of next steps, have you already decided what college you're hoping to attend or are you, um, and what your majors are? Um, I'm leaning towards microbiology and like disease studies and right now my first choice is UMass Amherst. Uh -huh. My first choice right now is Bridgewater State so I can go for elementary education. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Clap for you too. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Keep us in mind. I will. <laughs> Well, that's, that's great. Awesome. Thank, you Thank you for you. stepping yeah. up and spending time with us this year. Yeah. Happy to. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? 
All right. Well, we'll move forward. Is there any public forum? We have public, so. Okay. Um, you guys are welcome to stay for the meeting, or you're welcome to go do homework, which I'm sure you <laughs> have, uh, or active evening activities. They, they had choice. dinner plans already. They have dinner plans? <laughs> yes. Oh, did you bring anything for the rest of them? We can bring stuff back. There you go. <laughs> Enjoy. But, so it's up to you. But thank you. And we look forward to you at every meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Great to see you. Okay. We, we have warrants. We have minutes. Do we have anything else? Field trips or anything like that that's going around? Nothing. No. No. So I will um, move consent agenda A if there's no objection to that. Can we add the minutes from July the executive 8th? Executive session. Oh, nope. regular, July 8th. July we just 8th. held them last meeting. Yep. Yeah. Because there, were not, there wasn't a quorum. To right. Vote on it. Okay. So what, did we, and that's the only ones we have? Okay. Yes. So August 15th and July 8th. Okay. So would you like to entertain the motion to approve I will. consent agenda A with the addition of July 8th? So moved. Yes, you are. Okay. Sorry. Moved by Wendy. Second by. No, I feel like I, I might not have. Was, was everybody here for July? There, yeah, there weren't. And there's only like five people that can vote on July Oh, July 8th is Jane, Tara, Tammy, Karen, and Sarah. Okay. Okay. Well, so we, can, we can do it. Oh, yeah. Just abstain. So, are, where are we? Try it again. Are we on a second? Oh, I, mean, well, got, I got a motion. I'm looking for a second. second. Okay. All right. All those um, in favor of consent agenda A with the addition of July 8th minutes um, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Abstentions. Abstain. Jack and Wendy. And Erin. Right, but I, I, I made the motion to accept those. No. Is that still fine? That's okay. All right. I still need to abstain mm -hmm. from them. Okay. That's fine. That is fine. I made a motion of the bundle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oops, it's all good. Right. We should have separated, but we didn't. So we're good. All right. Uh, Sarah, is there a regional agreement update? We're trucking along. Um, no real update at this time. We would be getting into some pretty serious minutia if I went in. We don't want to do that. So. But we meet again next. Next meeting. Next week, right? Week. September 25th. Oh, at 2 30. Again, open to the public. All are welcome. Where do you meet? Here. September here. 25th. Right here. <laughs> September 25th, 6 30. Here, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's okay. Dr. DeFalco, oh, it's on right. to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so um, good evening, everybody. We're going to uh, open with uh, a couple of very important um, introductions. If we could ask our two instructional planning, teaching, and learning coaches and instructional coaches to come forward. Um, we thought that it would be great to take an opportunity to introduce the school committee and the public to our uh, kind of newest members of our team, <laughs> although not, uh, not both of them. But uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you, um, or reintroduce to most of you probably, Mr. Jeffrey Curran and Ms. Stephanie Lanou. And they're going to talk a little bit about just their work so far and how they've uh, integrated in into the district. And before they do that, just a kind of a quick headline. As everyone knows, uh, Mr. Curran's been here for quite some time. Um, serving in a variety of roles at the secondary level, both at the um, middle and high school. And uh, Ms. Lanou is new to us. And she spent over 20 years in the classroom and as a teacher leader um, in Mashpee, if I remember that correctly, yeah. at the elementary level. And uh, spent a little bit of time in the, in the private world, so to speak, in the private sector, and uh, just could not wait to get back into public education. And so we are very, very lucky to have both of them. And it's a really nice. Uh, blend of someone who knows a district that's been with us for quite some time and uh, a fresh set of eyes to the work that we're trying to do. So a very warm welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I would love to share some of the things that we've started doing already and um, some of the exciting, wonderful things I've been seeing. One is um, facilitating PLC meetings and looking at data from last year and, and using that data to inform RTI groups, reading groups, and instruction. 
and um, also in PLCs looking at uh, instructional practices that we are all already doing and compiling a list of those to look at um, three common great practices that we can look to be sure we all incorporate and um, classroom visits to observe these practices that are going on and um, celebrate them and then finally uh, coaching with individual teachers that have are looking for assistance in a variety of things within their practice so it's good stuff so kind of similar uh, I've started looking at and meeting with majority of middle school and high school uh, teachers uh, meeting in a variety of different ways uh, with the ILT teams um, uh, collaborating with both principals uh, collaborating with staff uh, collaborating in PLC groups with uh, all the subject areas and the things that we're kind of looking at or that we're working on is we're looking for best practices and we're gonna we've started some of that work and we're also going to continue with that work with looking at star data MCAS data and we've already started looking at uh, kind of sharing what folks are doing in classrooms bringing those things to the PLC meetings analyzing each other's tests lessons looking at best practices and kind of having that sharing moment uh, to make sure that either a to confirm hey yeah that's really great or have you thought about this and just in looking at best practices through the lens of what's best for students um, I've been in a lot of classrooms so far and it's kind of interesting that and, and again it's kind of been mentioned that I've been here since the dawn of time but uh, it's interesting to look at uh, through the lens uh, or different lens so looking at different classrooms and looking at uh, through the lens of what the students are doing and just kind of assessing and then having those conversations and questions with teachers and uh, it was something that now that I've kind of sat in the back of the room a few times I'm going you know I really wish I had somebody that you know that maybe could have looked at what I was doing to say have you thought about it this way and and are you is your lesson going where you think it's going and that type of those types of really you know educational questions uh, and I wish it was someone that you know that that I had had and it, it would be really interesting conversations to do that so I think both of us are kind of on that same plane of, of helping teachers and and or just you know listening to them and seeing what we can do to provide assistance if there needs to be that's great anybody have any questions or no, I for one am, am really excited to see how this all transpires and and I think it's a great addition so Thank we're, you. we're excited to to see what happens with it and hopefully we have great news <laughs> as we go along long progression here and if I could just add one thing that was really great we had started our instructional uh, leadership team meetings um, with the staff this actually Tuesday and uh, both uh, Jeff and Stephanie are, are clearly very active members in both of those mm -hmm teams helping to drive the work forward and uh, we ran out of room oh uh, wow I mean, the teams have grown to the point where we actually had to go into one of the adjoining classrooms and pull more desks uh, because we have had uh, an increase of interest in our teachers which is just right. which is yeah. huge yeah. Uh, so folks are really <coughs> intrigued and interested in in the work and right. so that's really good news that's exciting what okay. yeah, go ahead um, <clears throat> how often are the the PLC meetings held so for the middle uh, for the high school it is a uh, once every seven days per subject what I mean by that so I'm meeting with teachers every day at, at the high school so the math uh, department meant today I will meet them again in another seven school days and okay. then tomorrow I'm, I think it's science or ELA and then we'll do the same thing and the middle school is going to mean they're meeting in more in the afternoons uh, and that schedule I'm not as familiar but that's coming but team meetings are things that I can drop in on and I've also you know been inside classrooms as well and just hey what do you need and a lot of come on in and take a look and let's have a conversation afterwards so uh, those are coming but uh, daily at the high school and I think it's going to be similar to that at the, at the middle school and then so at MES it's weekly and at the complex it rotates every other week <coughs> per grade by 
By grade or by, by grade, by grade. So it, it may not be daily, but each grade has a PLC every week at MES and every other week at the couple. Nice. Okay. Um, I would just like to invite them back around February um, to see how this um, how the job description has evolved and how it actually flows into the actual work that's happening in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. So I know it's only been a f f the first few weeks, so I know that every, you know there's a lot of things happening, but I'm just curious to see how this particular, because this is new, um, how, how what you're doing is flowing into the classrooms. So sure. I, I'm thinking February would be a good time to invite them back to see the work that has transpired from this particular job descriptions. Um, Some student data. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll have a third coach too. Yes. With this yeah. In the special education department. Yeah. 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 Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for spending time Thank with you. us. Thanks for having, having us. us. Thank you so much. <laughs> We can take a pause with the. We uh, we're gonna pause a little bit on the written agenda and go kind of backwards to our agenda. Yeah, uh, we just would like to introduce Rep. Mike Soder, who's here. If you want to come on up and and thank you for taking thank you for time on your yeah. schedule. Sorry. Sorry, no, that's I'm a okay. A little bit late this morning. We no, coming no, from no, Boston no. and traffic. Well, with the punches, so no worries. Summer vacation's over. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Actually, uh, traffic was horrendous all summer too, so yeah. it's okay. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and as um, uh, last time from the last time that I was here uh, in the spring we, we had that workout session uh, breakout session with the different boards in the two towns um, this is coming at a great time for me to be here because I just had a meeting with chairwoman Peich, uh in regards to uh, chapter 70 reform um, that is getting uh, to hopefully an end uh, we're getting to decision-making time, uh, bills to be debated on the floor. Um, so we're hoping that is going to happen sometime, I think her wish is October. My guess is it's probably going to be November. But, you know, uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, we're going to be able to debate that fairly soon. Um, and they'll put some ease going into the next budget season and what what you will expect from the new formulations. Um, I'm, you know, you only see what you see. You only hear what you hear. Mm -hmm. um, the devil's in the details, I guess, at this point. Um, we'll see where we're, where, where we're going from that yeah. standpoint. Um, I will say one of the big things that I am really pushing, and uh, I know that uh, I think Dr. DePalco uh, uh, had, um, uh, met about the skills work grant program with mm -hmm. your colleagues in the area yeah. and uh, Uxbridge and I know uh, Superintendent uh, in Bellingham uh, also very interested in it. Mm -hmm. uh, the RFP has opened up for that. Uh, I would encourage uh, the school district to apply for the RFP. Mm -hmm. uh, let us please know when you do that so that we can support you on it. I think the skills work grant program shows great success and I think Uxbridge has had some great success with it keeping students in the district um, which is very important to your formulation numbers um, uh, some of the things that in the meetings that I've had with Uxbridge and in some of the schools that students were thinking about going to which were really top-notch private schools decided not to do it and stay within the district so I think you know that I think it should be commended uh, that program does that. It, it creates a whole new vibe for education. I think it creates a whole new s sense of energy mm. for the districts. Um, and I would, I can't stress enough that the money is there. Um, I can't stress enough that we will push every angle we can on the skills grant side. And I think mm. this is a big program, and I think they're going to even add more to it uh, as the lieutenant governor said in the last um, uh, skills grants that they s uh, gave out at Worcester uh, Worcester Vocational School in Worcester is that they w are going to be looking at revamping this to make it an even better bigger program wow. so um, they see the results uh, are working and they see that the uh, schools are adapting to it and it's actually creating a whole new 
Um, there is a void in Massachusetts, and a lot of it, I think, around here is, uh, we hear a lot of it is manufacturing. Uh, there's a huge skills, lack of skills uh, available for the manufacturing uh, sector. Um, and I think those are great opportunities, especially where you have the Blackstone Valley Chamber of Commerce, which represents all of Blackstone Valley, but very active um, in that program and very active in supporting school districts within those programs. So you, I think one of the things that I'm finding that we're very lucky to have is we have a Chamber of Commerce, um, a large Chamber of Commerce, working with our school districts in the, in the uh, Blackstone Valley to help coordinate and partner uh, to make this happen. So uh, I would encourage that. Uh, as far as the great news from the budget standpoint, obviously, regional school transportation. I mean, it wasn't 100%. I would love it to be 100%. But we went from well, 70 to 80, and that took well. multitudes of years to get there. <laughs> so I think we're in the right track. And I don't anticipate regional school transportation getting going back backwards. I would say that it's probably going to move forward. Um, but I think there was a big push. Um, big push with the House Ways and Means Chairman this year to emphasize um, the need for regional school transportation increases because it, 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 does, it takes a big toll on regional school budgets. Um, this school district, it, out of all of my four towns, helped the most. That will help you the most. Um, it does help with the BVT budget, um, municipal side of it for the, for the BVT budget, but um, I think from your standpoint, it, it will help better from uh, that standpoint. Uh, I know Dr. DeFalco and I had a conversation about uh, Circuit Breaker where wasn't going to quite do what it needed to do probably for the district this year. Uh, of course, that's all tied into students and, and enrollment and things like that. But in other school districts in the, in, in the district, it's going to help because they have a large uh, circuit breaker budget, uh, you know, like budget within that circuit breaker. So it's it, going to 70% is is a great increase for them. Um, it's going to help out tremendously. So it, it was a balancing act. Um, there was a, l a little bit more of a push because of the surpluses uh, in funding Chapter 70. So I think you saw probably a little bit more of an increase. I'm, <laughs> Minimal at best, I know, but at least it didn't go backwards, right. um, which they originally were talking mm -hmm. about. So that is a um, uh, that is a big plus. And and right now the surplus uh, that the state is moving in a in a in a wonderful direction. Um, we always lag a little bit in our catching up to where everybody is nationally, but we're actually um, seeing surpluses. We haven't seen the most recent ones from July and August. Um, certified, uh, we probably won't see August until November, but we should get more of an idea of where July came in. Um, a lot of that, they're seeing it from uh, obviously the uh, casinos. Mm -hmm. They're obviously seeing uh, as more and more marijuana facilities are coming on board, they're seeing an in increase in revenue. Um, so that, along with unemployment, is well below the national average, and everybody's paying taxes. And um, we're seeing that, that that's happening. So it's not for, from a spending side, we're doing basically what we're doing. But I, you know, there is increases in spending. So it's not like we're cutting back to for budget surpluses. And the rainy day funds, I, I am a big proponent for them because it's not going to last forever. And we're going to want to make sure that we can fund throughout the good times and the bad times, and that's what the rainy day fund will do for us. So um, we just are waiting for the Chapter 70 reform. I think everybody's waiting patiently to see what the final is going to be. Um, I wish I had more, but this timing-wise, she actually kind of surprised me uh, that she was so adamant that we're getting close. Mm. Um, from a standpoint, from one of the initiatives that I am trying to work on is I am trying to um, push more early childhood education. I had a great conversation with Chairwoman Peish about this, um, and I brought some folks in to meet her, uh, talking about pilot programs that they're running um, that collaborates both um, kind of a, a, a work for the parents, 
uh, program where the parents, we can get the parents back, and give them a springboard and get them off their feet, and also incorporate an early childhood uh, education component to that. So we're very excited about <coughs> that first meeting. Um, she was very excited about the results that they're seeing from the pilot program that these folks are running um, and the results. And I'm a big proponent of early childhood education, as you know, from a personal side. I adopted my daughter, so when you don't know the unknowns, you know when you, what you were as a child or your wife was as a child, but when you adopt, you don't know quite frankly what you're going to um, know about your child's behaviors and, and what they are going to from a comprehension standpoint. Um, for me, it was a huge investment. Um, to do it, but then I started wondering, like, I can do it. What about the people that can't afford to do this? And then I also thought of it from a business standpoint, from a special education standpoint. I think early childhood education is a smart investment early, so we save money on the back end. And we know that the back end is very expensive. And if we can focus on the front end, the back end, you'll see a tremendous savings. And the interesting thing about this pilot program that they're running was with 12 kids in Framingham in a, in a, um, a daycare center. And just to kind of tell you a little bit what, what these folks did, and I'll say who the foundation is, the Tally Foundation, and we have similar stories because their children were adopted. And their children have, uh, one of their children have special, uh, severe special needs. It was diagnosed in early childhood education um, programs. And again, they could afford it, and they have the same thought process that I had. How do, we, how do we open this up to everybody? Because not everybody can do it. And what they found was, as they were going, it wasn't just as easy as just snapping your fingers and creating a grant program and bringing people and having grants out there for, for children to pay for children to come into early childhood education. But they also realized there was an economic end of this and also a parental involvement end of this and they took all these pieces and put it together where the parents are involved mm. they also help parents find jobs and what the pilot program did was it showed results because the parents were involved in their children's performance in their education but what it also did was those grants that were helping pay for the tuition they started noticing those parents with the economic piece of it, helping these folks get job placement. Mm -hmm. They noticed in year two, year three, year four, that the parents were now paying the tuition. Mm. So from a state standpoint, you figure out how, how do you make this work from a state standpoint. And I have many ideas on how, that, how to do that. Um, we're going to put them together. I think some of it is in the skills work grant program. I think we have a lot of foundations that we can build a lot of different things. But a lot of it for cities and uh, for towns, if you know how to use the mitigation process through building houses, which Bellingham is going to do with early childhood education before I left, um, there's a mitigation um, program that's going to happen there. They built a new development. Part of the mitigation was to help develop a one-center early childhood education center. When you start collaborating and you start thinking outside of just education and tax dollars, what you do is you bring private and public sector together and you can make it work. So I think there was a lot of great things discussed in that meeting. It's a great start and I know that Chairwoman Peich was pleasantly surprised at some of the thought process that was going into this meeting at first and she didn't know what to expect. and. Um, I'm anxious to see, uh, uh, as, as Chairwoman Peich is, just to keep this pilot program and how we can accelerate some of these other pilot programs through the Tally Foundation. I mean, the Tally Foundation is bringing large companies together to create a tuition-based um, need where parents can actually go and, uh, and, and not worry about the early childhood education in year one and then year two, and it, it, it gradually works its way down. Um, I'm excited about it because I'm a firm believer, and, and I will keep saying it, it, it will save us money. And, I, and when I started doing the research on this, even before I became in the, in the legislature, um, the number, if we do this right, could save us billions on the back end with millions on the upfront. 
and in the difference there's savings to the taxpayer. And I think it really can be done without raising taxes and putting pressure on the state and property taxes. Um, but it's going to take a lot of wherewithal to do it, a lot of commitment to do it, and also new way of thinking mm -hmm. that a lot of times the public sector isn't eager to do. And, uh, but we'll see. We have a new early childhood education commissioner with a lot of new energy, and we're hoping for that meeting. So um, I come with you, come to you with hopefully some good news and mm -hmm. some future. Yeah. Um, but I will take any questions that you may have uh, that I can hopefully answer for you. The pilot program started children at what age? Well, uh, they started at, Eric, what was it, two, but so mostly they had a lot of four-year-olds. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, their theory is it's never too late uh, and it's never too early. Um, so um, there was always this mindset. There's one set of mindset from a lot of professionals in the early childhood industry in backgrounds say you really need to get these kids at an infant stage and, and bring them in and, and really start teaching them. Um, when they went through the process, that necessarily wasn't true. Mm -hmm. um, you can have the same results in year, uh, even, ha even having them one year in the program versus three or four years in the program. Um, but I think the program is set up in a way that if you wanted to start early, you mm -hmm. could start early. But they're seeing most of, the folk, most of the kids in those programs are either two or three years old um, in that program. Because a lot of times it's, you know, one of the, uh, and I would love to sometimes, I could sometimes, uh, I could certainly set up and if I brought Jill Dixon and Phil Dixon who start the Tally Foundation, if they actually said, hey, you could have a whole school committee meeting just talking about this and they would, I think, blow your mind in, in as far as how much thought they have put into this and how you can actually segment it out where they take they think about the teacher and making sure that the teachers have the benefits and making sure it's competitive um, thinking about uh, the parents and getting the parents involved because part of the, the whole part of the grant is you're going to work you're going to become self-sufficient in, in working towards the tuition but the most important piece of that is you have to commit in being involved in your child's education mm -hmm. otherwise you won't receive the grant and that's the biggest component and I think we all know sometimes that's one of the biggest challenges is is the parent involvement and in today's world where both parents work I know that's not always necessarily easy um, but I think they try to take that away. They try to take that out and make it so that yeah. it brings it together. A and I think they will tell you that it's not, they thought, oh, just easy. We'll just raise money. We'll get all this corporate money. We'll start this grant program. We'll do great. And one of the things they found out, and they'll tell you this, is that they would be afraid to talk to Dr. DeFalco because Dr. DeFalco would come back and say, that's great for year one, but what do I do in year two, three, mm -hmm. four, and five? I don't have a plan for that. I don't have district money for that. Mm -hmm. So they thought that process through. So I would never say that, by the way. <laughs> Go ahead, keep going. <laughs> well, say we'll figure it out. Let's, yeah, but, but it's I'm reality, Dr. Yeah. DeFalco. Yeah, right, it's right. reality. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. the problem with, I, I preach this all the time. Mm -hmm. And coming from the municipality side, I always say a grant is as good as it sounds. Right. But if we can't do it in year two, it. three, and four, why are we accepting sure. the grant? Right. Yeah. <laughs> why are we accepting it? Because now you bring hope, but it's not so easy to in year two to get that plan up and running. It, it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't make sense. And it puts a lot of pressure, undue pressure, on a lot of communities. Um, and that's one of the things I get a little skittish about with work. So that's the one thing I love about this program is that they thought the process through where you're weeding it out so that you are funding it. And it's just a, a cycle. But you're also going to be including a lot of um, money coming into the system because if you create this in, in, in an environment I think you're going to encourage a lot of people to want to live in your community and if you it is just an interesting fact about early childhood education and then I'll get off my soapbox on this Alabama and you think Alabama beats us mm -hmm. in early childhood education when you really start to look at why Toyota BMW 
all these major corporations are going down there. And if you look at Massachusetts, we're educating our youth, but they're moving out in droves. They're not living here, they're not staying here. Because we're in, one, we don't offer an environment where it's affordable for them to do it. Uh, and two, we don't offer a way that most of these young millennials now are going to have to, um, and Eric is probably cringing behind me right now, but are going to have to work as a double income family. And, and in order to do that, you have to have some sort of early based childhood education plans. Otherwise, the, this group is, is looking at it from that perspective saying they have everything. If I go work for BMW down in Alabama or Toyota in Alabama, I'm going to have a great paying job, it's affordable, and they invest in, the in children at an early age. Mm -hmm. Kids. And if you look around the world from a competitive standpoint, that's how we're, we don't compare to everybody else around the world. It's a, it's a big undertaking, but other countries have figured it out that you will, uh, it will help you in the long run getting these kids in early. And um, I'm, I, like I said, I'm a, I, something I've, it's a thought process that I've had ever since the day that I became a father. And I became a father late in life. 37 is late in life nowadays, <laughs> becoming a father. And, you know, um, my daughter just said to me on her birthday Sunday, how about a sister or brother? Oh, honey, it's too late for that. <laughs> <laughs> too late. Unless they're 17, I'll adopt them from foster care or 13 or something. I can do that. But, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that we take ser I take seriously. And I really, I look at it from a business standpoint. Strict, strict business standpoint, it makes sense. And uh, I'm big on return on investment. And I think if we make the investment early with the right way, in the right way and partner with the right people, um, we can make it happen. Yeah. We can make it happen. Any other questions? Um, Aaron, go ahead and say something. <laughs> this is going to be my last comment for the whole meeting. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I just wanted to say that we've lived through accepting the grant. We, we did the, the kindergarten grant mm -hmm. in this district. Mm -hmm. Um, I think right before um, I came onto the committee, but we lived through the now you pay for it, mm -hmm. you know, find, right. find a way, and you have it didn't now stop you our district from yeah. from participating because it clearly was the better option for the kids. Um, so I appreciate everything you're saying. Yeah, it's just it's t it's one of those tough things that I you know when we when I first came on board as a selectman. The biggest thing that we had to discuss is going from half day kindergarten to full day kindergarten. Mm -hmm. and I came from full day, I was in full day. Oh no, I was half day, but in, in, in Worcester where I grew up, it was full day. And, and I said, why are we having this conversation? And why is anybody even fighting this? Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah. you think about it. And again, it's the early portion of it that I say, you know, if you want to be competitive in this world, you have to start early. And these kids have to um, have an opportunity. If we're not going to give them a chance, um, and, and sometimes grants are great and they do the right thing and they got the, you had the right commitment and the right tenacity to follow through with it. A lot of communities find it extremely, extremely tough to do it. Sure. And I think the grant process has to be in a way where it's, <coughs> it's great and I hope when it comes to education, where education is so costly, that when we come up with these programs, it can't just be a one and done. It has to be a one, two, three, four year process and it might be 100, 75, 50, 25, and then it gives you time to build a base and a foundation. Mm -hmm. But we can't just keep, you know, and I think that's what they're finding with the skills grants program, that they can keep investing and then doing amazing things with yeah. it. And my challenge is for you, for me, for, for our district, is to help you get kids to stay in the district. School choice is here, it's not gonna go away. The reality of it is, and anybody that's listening, school choice isn't gonna go away. I know a lot of people hit me on Facebook on that all the time. Well, representative, keep them keep in the district. Why are you making them go? Change the laws. Well, I can't because it's, it's been, you know, we can change the laws, but you're kind of going against the will of the people. The will of the people across the state have said, this is what we want. Last charter vote, 
was different. So that kind of gave us a signal, okay, we need to slow back on charter schools. But you see charter schools, those applications that we're in are still there. But what I've been doing is meeting with the Department of Education, and we met with them. And, you know, it's amazing when you meet with them and you say, how do I get the students in my district not go to Franklin or Milford, that Milford's going to be doing a charter school, but let's use Franklin. How do I get my kids not in my district from Blackstone, Millville, not to go to Franklin? What do I need to do to stop that? And it's amazing. They'll say, well, if you look at this and you look at this and you do this and you start an innovation school, and I say, whoa, time out, whoa, back up. What would you just say? <laughs> innovation, what's an innovation school? You know? And those are things that I'm now interested in looking at. So how do I help you? How can I help you create? And, it, and, and you know the funny part? When you start asking the questions, it, the innovation schools can be in an existing building. It can be in existing classrooms. It can offer a certain amount of, of things. It would be more work for Dr. DeFalco because it would have to work, report to two different boards, a board of director mm -hmm. and a school committee. But it keeps those dollars and keeps those kids in the district because you're focusing in on the exact same programs that these charter schools are offering, but you're putting it in your district. And it's amazing. Eric and I were shocked at how fast you can turn one of those programs into your school district as quickly. But it's going to take a lot of tenacity on the school board's side because there's union contracts that you have to deal with. And there has to be that, you know, wanting it in the district. And but the skills grant programs, I think, are, are, are another great opportunity. I think what you and your colleagues are doing, Dr. Falco, to keep kids in the district and working together because you know you can't an erect a new right. building. Yeah. But the things that you're doing and the programs that you're going to and making it work and working with each other, this group goes to this school, this group goes to this school, I think one is an unbelievable thing because I think the kids get to inter intertwine with different districts. But I also think it's, a, it's, it's creating an excitement yeah. for kids because it, it almost creates a kind of a college environment mm -hmm. a little bit. It prepares yeah. them. Yeah. We just Absolutely. launched Tuesday night at the Ed Hub. 18 awesome. kids from seven different communities in Blackstone Valley. And I'm really proud to say five of the 18 are from BMR. They're our That's freshmen. Awesome. Mr. Dudek was there, myself, the other uh, superintendents and uh, principals from the other participating towns, the teacher that is running the course from Uxbridge. Uh, and our parents, the parents were there with the kids. It was just one, of, actually I called Jane like yeah, giddy on great. the way home, like, like you're not going to believe this was so great because it was such an awesome experience and just the energy was awesome and then the teacher after about a half hour threw all of us out <clears throat> and uh, kept all the kids there and running the, the first class. Yeah. It was really Folks, cutting edge and very different. I would be shocked if by next year you don't double that. I agree. I agree. Because okay. everything that I'm seeing just out of Oxbridge, just from, you know, looking at the program, it's amazing um, what's happening. And a lot of the, a lot of the kids are choosing not to go to, not to discourage the BVT. It's in our school district, but a lot of kids are deciding to stay. I mean, that tells you a lot about what the program's doing, and it's making I think education a whole different, giving education a whole different. And I said to the lieutenant governor. I said, I hope you're going to make it better. I hope you're going to make it stronger. I hope you're not going to pull funding right. <laughs> uh, and, and make it harder. Because I think I'm, we're starting to get our other districts involved now. And I don't want us to fail. And we've been talking this program up because it's such great success. Mm -hmm. And it gives kids that are not going to go to college a skill and an opportunity. And, we, and that is a goal for all of us. At the end of the day, that's a goal for all of us that we don't want somebody leaving here and not thinking that they don't have a future because they didn't go to college. They have a skill. They come out of, I, you know, somebody asked me what I thought about skills grant programs. I said, you know, the funny part about these skill grants programs are all the same programs that I had in high school that aren't there anymore. Right. <laughs> You're right. You're right. They really are. They're, I mean, they really are. And I, you know, but, sure, but they've made them mm -hmm. better, stronger, more effective. Um, and more emphasis on well, them because they're involving the private sector yeah, into pipeline. a lot yeah, of these programs. And, and they're, they're, it's a creation of active education. Right. Education has become a passive thing where I, you know, and we're trying, uh, you know, Mike is trying really hard to become active again and, and engage people and, right. and give opportunities. And, and programs <laughs> like this do that. It's hands-on. It's I'm doing it, I'm not just learning it. I'm doing it. Right. So. And, and then the great thing about the, the, the collaboration with the businesses 
is they're teaching them, they, they're, yeah, one company I talked to said, the great thing is I'm teaching them, these kids, the way I want to, if I bring them in and hire them. Correct. <coughs> right. mm -hmm. They're not just learning it off of a basic system and then they have to come in here and figure out, we have to kind of retrofit them. Right. We're actually teaching them how it's really done, mm -hmm. and we're giving that equipment, and we're partnering and working with that equipment. So, I, I think I applaud you. That's that's fantastic. If you are going going to submit the uh, a grant, please let us know because we jump right on those for you and get right on those for you. Um, I think we're all set with. I know we had some talks about the water situation. Um, I have the EPA coming to the district, Eric. Right the EPA coming to the district we actually talked to uh, the the new town administrator about he's coming to Millville so I think we targeted the the, the, the water situation there um, we're trying to get some help from the EPA so we are doing everything on our part I hope that, I um, that I hope that you know that just don't wait for me to please don't wait for me to come <laughs> to a school committee meeting or office hours I tell everybody to call me we jump right on it if you wait until I come again to a school committee meeting to tell me something, the way bureaucracy works, it's another three months before we get it right. resolved. I like to start working on things right away. Um, each one of you, Dr. DeFalco has my cell phone number. He has a, just please reach out to me and reach out to Eric. We will jump right on it. Um, and uh, I look forward, just a quick E, triple E update. If I could, because I've got some people watching. You can. <laughs> um, I, I'm learning a lot more about mosquitoes than I ever want. I should get a skills grant just because I learned so much about mosquitoes and, and viruses. Um, they are spraying. They're continuing spraying. They're going to continue to spray, I think, through this week. Uh, then they're going to evaluate uh, next week if there, no more spraying has to be done. Um, obviously, uh, Blackstone, Millville, Uxbridge are all in that um, uh, kind of not critical, but right below critical. Uh, I even forget the stage, Eric. What is it? What, what is it? Uh, Hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, and uh, so we're there. Uh, Bellingham. Unfortunately, when you have cases, human cases, as close as you do to the area, it's going to happen. So uh, I, I would encourage all you school, all the school kids, to please the parents protect your kids uh, the best way you can with any of the repellents that you like to use that you want to use. Make sure it's on them. If you're going, I know you've canceled. I think uh, you're still in that canceling yeah, so after six, school after th 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 after six o'clock. Uh, you know, I would uh, that still stands. We haven't gotten any updates from the DPH on that. I know it's frustrating a lot of the football coaches and the nighttime sport coaches, but unfortunately, I you know people ask me, you know, why are you making such a big emphasis on this? Because I say one person stricken with this That's in right. my district yeah. is too many. One yep. person in the entire state, and if you look, the young girl in Sudbury, that is going to have a very tough life because of this disease, uh, this because of this virus. Um, you know, our job is to prevent that the best way we can. I don't want to say this. I say this from not from a standpoint that I want kids to go to school till the end of June, but a nice insulated winter would be grateful this year because it will insulate the ground. It will kill a lot of this nesting. And um, they're on it, though, for next year. And I know the legislature um, is going to make sure the funding is there to start even you know, uh, monitoring, spending money on monitoring and things that we need to, to do for the next wet spring season. And um, fortunately, we had a very wet spring and a very hot summer, and you mix those two together, and they stop code. biting so, birds, and mm -hmm. birds start flying okay. to other areas, and all of a sudden it just spreads. So, Go ahead. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for your very frequent updates um, on Facebook, mm -hmm. is where I've seen yours um, almost daily. So I really appreciate that. Do you know if they're spraying tonight, or is the temperature too? <laughs> no, uh, the temperature would be probably okay. Um, I, Clouds. I we have to update, but I also think they came through Blackstone. Not other. according to last night's map. <laughs> Not last night's map. What about it, the night it before? Was like one of last night or the night before they came through Blackstone on Lake Hiawatha side. Lake Hiawatha side. Okay, yeah. So they're they're doing 551 square miles. I think is what Every they told night? us. Um, a total, like, it, oh, total yeah. from, uh, so I think basically Norfolk County threw up through Walpole, I think. It looked down. like last night, for, they were south of, uh, they were Douglas State Forest, um, and then it, and then they were, it must have had another plane going, mm -hmm. um, it looked like they hit Franklin and north of that. 
but maybe it was Bellingham yeah. area too. I'm, I mean, right now the weather coming into this weekend is still moderately warm. Last night was really humid. Last night would have been the night they, they, they came through, but I think if it was raining, it wasn't probably raining that bad, so they were probably able to do it. The whole purpose of air flight when the warm weather comes, these mosquitoes flock up, they nest up. That's why bats love them, because they can get them and, and eat them. They flock up, they spray them, they kill them, well, they, you get them swarms that go up and then they come down when they s obviously sweat and things like that. And then I found out horses sweat profusely and cows and things like that, where dogs mm. don't necessarily sweat, sweat and they're protected more. So it's, mm. it's all driven. That's why the human thing is, 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 is so important not to be out in sports and things like that yeah. because, you know, you get football players and, you know, lacrosse players playing at night in a hot human night. Um, Rugby players. <laughs> I don't want to leave you guys out. Um, Bad practice yesterday. <laughs> you don't want to be, you know, the, 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 the sweat attracts them. And when you're playing football, you don't realize you're not going to put repellent on and all this stuff. So fortunately, you know, they could, they're targets and for this. And um, we're, we're, like I said, we're learning a lot more about mosquitoes than I really want to know about. But um, it's it's a serious situation, and, and that's why you know I apologize if people think that I'm overdoing the announcements. Um, no. However, uh, I'm the type of person that you can be really angry at me if that's what you're going to be angry at me for. Then be angry at me for that, um, because it, if 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 it if if I have not one case in my district with that issue, a human uh, issue, um, then I know I did my job. Yep. So and I feel good about that. I think it helps when, when surrounding towns are all on the same page. Because oh, yeah. I know that my kids play football in North Smithfield, and it took a while for them to get on the bandwagon. So, I mean, when you're, you're abutting other towns that are still doing outdoor things and you're indoors, you know, so I think once people start getting on the same page, I think it's much more it's beneficial. Yeah. Um, and like I said, you don't know that danger unless it happens to you, and that's the worst case scenario. So preventative is important. And I just want to make sure that you understand from a monetary standpoint. Um, I know some people are nervous about, oh, all the spring, who's going to pay for it, budgets, all this. The governor has already made it very clear. Legislator, legislature will, I'm sure, are going to pass it. Uh, but the governor said we are going to make sure we reimburse the cities and towns that have overspent in their budgets uh, for the contracted mosquito, right. normal mosquito. So. I, you know, I, I know sometimes, you know, it gets a little bit, <coughs> people think about those things. And I just want to, you know, put people at ease. It's not going to affect your school budgets. It's not going to affect your municipal budgets. The, we have a supplemental coming up, and um, it's going to be in the supplemental. So, okay. Anybody else? Questions? Thank you for the time. I Thank appreciate you. it. No, we Thank appreciate you. you taking the time. All right. It's Thank you very much. And awesome. and it's a good connection. All right. And um, like I said, don't let and anybody listening and anybody here, please do not wait. Just contact us <coughs> immediately, <coughs> immediately. And as I say to every school district, I would love mm -mm. any of your children, that, any of your schools, classes, anybody that wants. I know I'm going to be at, uh, uh, yes, I'm going to be at Ms. Conti's uh, class tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That I'm always willing to do. Um, and, but field trips just please let us know if you're gonna if you want to come to the state house um, we take a lot of pride in that we just yeah we'll set up the tours and we do a lot of great things but we, we have a little extra special things that you don't get on the tours that <laughs> we can do so I would encourage it I would uh, be excited to have uh, folks from BMR I know Eric would be excited because this is his this is his home school district he has a lot of pride when that happens, um, as do I. And um, we're excited uh, to have anybody. And it's always an open door for any of you. Anyone ever want to come? You can come see my little 2 by 4 Dr. <laughs> DeFalco, <laughs> see my 2 by 4 hmm. well, for, I say it's a jail cell without the toilet or the bunk beds. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right, moving uh, forward, I'd like to ask Jill Pilagalrani to uh, join us and take us through uh, a conversation regarding special education. And we're going to look at it really through uh, kind of where we have been, where we are, and where we're going. Um, and Ms. PG is going to go into some 
uh, much much needed detail around programming and what we have to look forward to in terms of making sure that all truly means all mm -hmm. that we are reaching every student every day. Ms. PG. Hello. Hello. Hi, Bill. So, like um, Dr. Falk was saying, I'm going to be sharing the past, present, and future of special education here at Blackstone Millville Regional. Um, so, we, as special education department, our school community, are dedicated to meeting the needs of all of our students. Um, as it, it is a purpose in our district blueprint to develop happy, healthy, and proficient students who are prepared for college, career, and community. So, what I'll focus on tonight is where we've been where we are and where we're going. I might forget. If I forget to push us forward, <laughs> we'll tell you. Just adding an extra Quick. step to my presentation tonight. So, so where we've been, um, last year, and I think I've ex described it as more of a year of exploration and discovery here in the district. I've been here for a lot of years, but, you know, my, um, my experience has been limited to some of the buildings, so I really got a chance to take a look at the district as a whole last year. So if you look in our first box when it says the program model, we did start the year with last year with 200, uh, 224 <coughs> students from across the district. And our model that was in place, we did have an interim director of special education, and our chair people were building-based. So we did have our BMR team chair, who was also a teacher, and she took care of our 8 through 12 plus. Our middle school team chair that um, was also a teacher, did our six through eight. We had an AFM JFK team chair. Okay. Sorry, I don't have a copy. I was just trying to. <laughs> um, our AFM JFK team chair was K through five. No. It's in the warrants. Yeah. Huh? Oh. It's in the warrants. Sorry, oh. I think she was. Okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Do you need a call? Page of the warrants. Where are the warrants? Right there. It's in the warrants. Folder. It's in the warrants. Okay, just take my note. Yeah. We're good. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I just want to make sure you have the warrants. Right. What you need. It's Tammy's fault. She threw the warrants at me. <laughs> okay. Um, and at MES, we had a point seven team chair that did our PK through five. Again, like I said, these were building based, and what I found was we had a lot of different ideas and models and understanding of our special ed process and procedures across different buildings. Um, and if you look at the bottom, it says Millville, the AFM, JFK, um, middle school, and BMR. Mm -hmm. I just gave you the staffing that was in place for last year with our teachers and paraprofessionals. And underneath were more of our support staff, our OT, our PT, our BCBA. I made a note there that said teacher created yeah. schedules. So <clears throat> it's very different how we do scheduling here for special ed in all the buildings. Um, at the high school and the middle school, you know, the team chair is working with our principals. They're getting schedules together um, as part of the master schedules because they're classes. At the elementary school, it's a little bit different. The, the schedule is built, and then our special ed education teachers, when school starts, need to build their schedules based on what the students need. So it is done a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. It's teacher-created schedules once the year starts. I'll get into a little bit more of that when I say where we are and where we're headed. Um, the next section is curriculum and instruction. So what I discovered last year that we really do have a varied instruct a lot of different instructional methodologies, content and strategies, which at first it can be a good thing. However, we really need to look at are they truly anchored in well established in a well established foundation and understanding of truly what students need. I found that there although we have a lot in place, they lack focus lack focus in the kind of instructional materials we're using, as well as the practices and methodologies. Our staff also had inconsistent access to regular education programs. And some, students, some teachers who did actually have it, they just weren't using some of the, the programs that were out there. We had a lack of consistent implementation of programs across and within grade levels, buildings, and district as a whole. So we would have some students who may be starting a program in second grade, and they're starting a brand new program in third grade, and might be doing a little bit of something different in fourth grade. So it's almost starting from scratch every time, but we need kids to continue to move forward. Can you give an example of like those programs that you're talking about, per se? Yeah. So if you look at the bottom here, I have some of them in there. Mm -hmm. um, so we've used things like Edmark. The, so this is an addition to. 
This is right. special ed programs. Edmark, Reading A through Z, Foundations, Read Live, Teacher Made Materials, Computer Generated Worksheets, but we did also look at Ascend Math last year. So what was happening is I think that teachers were just picking and choosing, and again, I think all with good intention. How do I meet the needs of my students? But there was so much out there, it wasn't focused. Mm -hmm. We weren't saying, these are our main go-tos. Not to say that you're not going to have that population of students who might need a little bit more, but these are our go-tos. But what was happening, there weren't any go-tos. It was kind of left to staff to say, I'll try this and I'll try this. So what was happening is, if we know a student needed some reading intervention, one teacher may choose one program. The next year's teacher may choose another program. The following year. So again, that's different language. It's different philosophies. It's different instructional mm -hmm. strategies. So it's almost, they're constantly starting fresh. Mm -hmm. And not to say having options isn't good, but there's right. a point where you have to focus. Mm -hmm. um, also, our data collection strategies and techniques were varied and they were inconsistent. And we really did have um, a limited use of data to drive instruction. However, moving forward, there's even more data now. So we're going to be able to use that to drive instruction. Um, our continuum of services. In the district, we do offer full inclusion, partial inclusion, substantially separate. Last year, our out of district population was at 24 and one on a 45 day assessment. And if you look under there, what I did is I noted the more specialized programs we have across the district and in each building. In Millville, we do have an integrated preschool. We had five sections last year, and we also have a sub separate PK there, one, one section of that. Um, at the complex, we had an upper essentials classroom, a lower essentials classroom, and a pragmatic learning classroom. Last year at the middle school, we didn't have any specialized programs. And at BMR, we have three. We have our Community Connections program, which is our 18 to 22 year old program. We have an essentials classroom, and we also have an alternative learning classroom. What I want to focus on, too, is just like, why does she have that little picture up at the top? Mm -hmm. So I just want to say that we have the seeds for success. We have our teachers, we have our paraprofessionals. Um, we have our processes and procedures, our assessment, our practices, our programs. We have our students and families ready to go. We have a strong admin team. So they, that, those seeds are there. So where we are. This year is we're building our foundation for change. And I know this, to be very clear, I am very cognizant of the fact that change can be very difficult um, it, for everyone. But we're it's going to happen if we're moving forward. So again, if you look in the, on the left-hand side, our program model, we did present last year they were looking to change our special ed model. Um, so our intent this year was to start off um, with a director of learner supports and an assistant administrator for special education. However, our plan didn't go as we had hoped. We did have candidates, we did interview, but we couldn't find that fit for our district. So we kind of looked at what's our next step for plan B to kind of get the support that we need. So we are moving forward with our Director of Learner Support Services and a planning, teaching, and learning coach. And actually, Dr. Falco, you have a packet on your desk probably Monday morning <laughs> mm -hmm. Perfect. to bring someone in. Um, so we will have our planning, teaching, and learning coach. Um, we will have our team chair model change. And you'll notice there's an error on there. It does say we have a team chair person 7 through 12. That should be corrected. It's 8 through 12. And then we have a team chairperson four through seven and a team chairperson pre-K through three. And we're hoping this is going to unify what we're doing. Um, it'll, we'll have more consistent communication, consistent expectations. And what we're also doing this year is we're partnering our team chairs up with the school psychologist. So we will have our same model here, but they're going to have a school psychologist that works with them. So that means kindergarten in Millville kindergarten and Blackstone. It, we're looking at the same processes, procedures, models, expectations, and same thing for all the way through to bring us together. If you look at the bottom, this is what you, this year's staffing looks like. Same with our supplemental services. And this year, what was a little bit different, again, the middle school and high school principals were involved as well as the team chairs. And this year, I had the opportunity to sit down with um, both elementary principals. Um, we looked at all of class lists. We looked where students were, what student needs to help develop, put those schedules together. So when school started, I had the opportunity to sit down with each special education teacher at the elementary schools to review. So we're all on the same page and our kids were ready to go. Curriculum and instruction. We do have our planning, teaching, and learning coach, hopefully, within the next few days. And we're hoping that this person, just like with our two coaches now, 
be able to support our inclusion models, support our pull-out models and programs, ensure that we have high standards no matter what, um, where our kids are, in or out of the classroom. We want to focus on the quality of instruction and our instructional methodologies. The other thing is we have to develop focused instructional methodologies, content and strategies. Right now, we're, our work with focused schools, we are going to be developing as a district two to four best instructional practices designed to address our instructional focus, which is problem solving. And again, in special ed, we may look at what are those few focused interventions. Again, it's great to have all of these things to go to, but we really need to focus so our time and energy. We need to have consistent access to regular education programs, and we are. Our principals have been fantastic to make sure our current staff and our new staff is getting absolutely everything that, I, that they need. We need consistent implementation of programs across and within grade levels and buildings. So what we're identifying is, out of those programs, what is our go-to reading program? What is our go-to math program? So although, for example, in, in the elementary school, we may be using Envisions, we may have students who need a little bit more. We did trial Ascend Math. We got a lot of positive feedback from it last year, so we are looking at Ascend Math this year. <laughs> Teachers liked it because it could really focus on an area. After you went through either the STAR assessment or the OWN assessment that we do for Ascend, teachers can assign specific lessons or follow-ups for kids to be able to do that. So again, we're using the same language, same procedures, so there's some carryover year to year. I have a question. Yep. I'm trying to process really quickly right now. Um, so last year you said in terms of the planning and the the planning like teacher schedules and things that I, I could be just processing this wrong but last year you know you had the special educator coming in trying to fill the spots in the teacher created um, schedules correct so has that changed this year is that what I'm seeing that that they have been plugged you know I don't want to say plugged in oh, but okay. there, there's a there, it was centered around the student or the needs of, of the specific special ed education students. Right, so what was different this year with um, our two, two elementary principals, okay. we were able to sit down and go through lists of students, the classes they were in prior to school starting. Right. The list of students, the classes they were in, the, the teacher classes, and then developed the A schedule. Schedules prior to school starting. Okay, so, so it wasn't plugged in like I can fit you here, here, and here. It, it, it meshes. What the students need. Okay. Right, and then we went from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And not to say, so there's always tweaking that comes Right, right. I just wanted to yeah. really understand the difference between mm -hmm. what it looked like yeah. and what has changed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I noticed a big shift of t uh, special educators at the elementary level. It Was there a shift to students as well? Um, yeah, we're going to get there. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. Um, and again, use of data to drive instruction. Um, is the you, data points stars and, and or uh, you have other, obviously, the, the ones that are listed, but some of them are, you know. So some the, of our data, I mean, when I talk about data, it's any data we collect. It could right. be formal, it could be yeah. informal. So it could be our star. It could be data we collect on our work samples on a regular basis. It could be our FNP. It could be some of the data we get when we use Ascend Math or okay. when you use, use Read Live, it gives you <coughs> a So actual data, not the I think and I feel. It's this is what the student needs, uh, is showing. So we have, with your support, we have 10 teachers in the district who are participating in Wilson, three of our reading specialists and the rest of our special education teachers, and they are across the district. Um, at every level, we are going to have Wilson certified and trained people. Question? Yep. <laughs> no, go right ahead. Um, this might be too early, but um, with the 10 specialists being trained in Wilson, will there be some type of plan moving for the summertime for them to carry over the Wilson, Wilson support? For students, maybe you mean as like a, an ESY. Yeah. So if any student is identified with ESY, they so get they get it. I understand that. But um, with these teachers that we're spending the money training, I think that's my question. So I guess it would depend mm -hmm. if they apply. Okay. Do you know what I mean? I just wasn't sure if we had to have something that we could offer um, yeah, those students. They may not they may not meet ESY, but they may be low enough, and yes. we're training these ten. 10 teachers that you know it could be a, a, a well, sometimes we have tutoring Is that's that that's yeah. yeah for those for those that may not meet the ESY but will right so move us forward just to forecast um, yeah. uh, Ms. Schaefer and I uh, and her school-based team we had a uh, through Ms. Schaefer we had a lengthy discussion last spring about applying for a 21st century grant mm -hmm. and um, hooked up 
um, Ms. Schaefer and her team with some outside support to develop that grant of which we are going to be putting together for this year. Um, and we are looking to, um, and there are different levels of that, but I believe we're, we're looking at either the 40 student and the 60 student mm -hmm. uh, program, and that work will start over the summer. Right. So that we can actually run some programming starting in the summer. I just so, feel like we, we did spend a lot awarded. of money for that training, yep. and I know that um, even low, low students on the reading you know they would benefit from that and so if we're going to invest mm -hmm. 10 teachers being trained in Wilson that that's really well that's really good so you know I, I would just be curious on what a summer our summer offerings need yeah. to change like yeah. drastically yeah. from just ESY to actually a very robust yeah. program just, so we're looking at to start that with the 21st yeah. or just program. something to use you know to utilize that training absolutely yeah. yep no, I agree. Um, so the next one says progress program uh, program access and implementation and focus professional development so if you look at any visions the big ideas empowering writers we use novels and anthologies we just want to make sure we have focus PD so our teachers know how to use you know the programs that are in place not just our regular teachers but our special ed teachers as well um, again I mentioned that ascend math is something that we're incorporating this year foundations is something that we already incorporate as a district our Wilson reading will be up and running and what's great is all of our teachers who are currently being trained did participate in the three-day overview and with participation in the three-day overview Wilson will tell you yes you know you can move forward and, and, and start implementing the program um, so some of our teachers are and it'll be great practice for them as well I know they work individually with students but they have the foundation to begin to implement in read live read naturally um, again, it does have both components, both the fluency, it has a little comprehension, it does have some decoding. We also still are using some programs like Edmark, Touch Math and Reading H through Z, because we do have some students who are more intense. And that's okay, but we have to designate this is the next step of it. It's not just whatever you think is going to work or pull the worksheet off online. They need to be focused and they need to be taught with fidelity. Um, and this year, I would love to um, investigate writing and trials and writing programs. Beyond uh, special education writing programs or beyond empowering writers? Beyond empowering writers, for like a support for special ed. Okay. Like we did with Ascend Math. It was, it was just a <coughs> Okay, I have one, I'm not going to say one question because yep. I keep asking questions, mm -hmm. but okay. um, are the special educators involved in the PLC um, with the writing, are they involved in the PLC meetings yes. each week? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And what will be nice now is during our, um, it's our PLCs, we will have a special education coach to be able to join them as well. Mm. Our continuum of services, the top stays the same, but what you'll notice is our audit district last year was 24, and this year we have 22. So we brought two students back because of the specialized programs that we, um, we uh, developed and we expanded here in district. And that slash one is we still have a 45-day assessment student. Um, if you look, and this might answer some of the questions, um, if you look at the schools, we have Millville, again, AFM, but Millville still has our integrated preschool and our sub-separate PK. A pragmatic learning classroom has moved to Millville, and we have the new alternative learning program that is in Millville as well. At the AFM JFK now is housed our essentials program. The other essentials program moved to the middle school because as students age, the programs are, age, are going with them. And at BMR, we still have our community connections, our essential and our alternative learning program. And what was really good when we, over the summer, um, we did have some of our teachers who were actually teaching some of this, these programs, did some of their ESY there. And Christina it was very helpful. What we did is we talked about what would be the impact if, the, if both of these classrooms were here. We looked at the hallway, we went through classrooms, we talked about staffing, so all of those skills, all of those things were discussed before they came over here, um, over to Millville. And what we found is not only do we have um, these having specific programs here in Millville, they're able to share staff, share resources. Our BCBA, where a lot of our specialized programs are in Millville, is able to spend, do you know what I mean, the time that she needs there. Not that she doesn't go to the other buildings, but the programs are focused. And it's really nice for those programs to have some of that staff to, for, for support. At the bottom, it's a little bit different. So see, these are some of the changes that have occurred this year. In Millville, 
we have a K, we're, we're focusing on focus, our special ed teachers focusing in specific areas. In Millville, we have two special education teachers. One of them is a K-5 math focused special education teacher, and one of them is a K-5 literacy focused special education teacher. And again, what was really nice is we had a chance to sit down both with Christina and the special ed teacher who was there at the time, and we kind of looked at all of that. Um, so we're trying to get our teachers, and I bring this up later, not only are they going to be masters of the methodology, but they have to also be masters of content. So this is a great way to start that. So we'll be able to get some feedback and see how that's going, but our teachers are going to be able to really focus on that content with the students. At the middle school, we are investigating. They started a little bit with a model of trying to find people who are <coughs> more focused for content special education teachers. That's something that we've started a little bit. It's something we need to explore more. At BMR, we already have, because it's a requirement, content focused, highly qualified special education teachers in, in you know, the English, the math, the sciences. Um, at JFK, we started a mini model. Our K-1, we're going to have a K-2 teachers K-1, and again, one of them is going to focus on the K-1 math, and one of them is going to focus on the K-1 literacy. And the thing I want to stress here is our inclusion. It needs to be pur purposeful placements and support with specialized instruction. Right now in the district, we do have inclusion, supported inclusion with teachers, with paraprofessionals, um, and we've also looked at the elementary schools having flexibility for our teachers during the RTI to be able to take a look at all of our students to see how they're doing and see what other interventions that they need. At the high school and the middle school, the students get some academic support now so they're able to monitor th through there. Jill, yep. um, on the uh, BMR, the content-focused um, teachers, yes. are, are, is the model such that a particular student who may have an ELA-based goal and a math <coughs> goal, they're working with two different special right. educators? Mm -hmm. To, to provide the whatever instruction is required so and then someone case managers or whatever we call it here absolutely so what we try to do at the high school is we may have I may have one of my teachers who's highly qualified in math and one is an ELA when those students and they might get some academic support and they or might have some inclusion support what we do at the high school is during their academic <coughs> support they have it with the liaison who that liaison would be and the paraprofessional who supports the students during inclusion. So they're able to really have that, you know, communication, they're able to collaborate. But yeah, so even though too, and you know, we, we have a very, they're a very collaborative um, staff at the high school. They're always sharing, they already know what's go going on with students. So yes, you could have a student who has two different teachers, but there is collaboration, there's ongoing data collection and shared between them. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what does it look like on the AFM side at the complex right now? So at the AFM side, so we have an inclusion model. Right now we have one teacher and one paraprofessional per grade level, except for the K-1s. They're going to be shared. So we have inclusion and we have pullout. So sometimes, our, depending on what the student's IEPs came up on, we have sometimes when teachers are in there the full time, sometimes paras are in there full time, sometimes teachers are in there half time. It all depends on what the student IEP calls for. So separate from the essentials program is what you're saying? Yes, essentials program is a, is a separate program. Right now it's um, servicing our uh, few fourth and fifth graders. It is different program. That is separate. Um, and then just to back up a little bit, when you were going through the program model mm -hmm. um, and what, where we've been and where we are, mm -hmm. you mentioned having one school psychologist per team chair. Correct. How many school psychologists do we have? Three. So we are currently at three? We and were at three and we still are. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just that last time they were split up in kind of a, an awkward Five way. Buildings. It wasn't even. We had someone who was at the complex and a little time in Millville and someone spent some time at Blackstone a little bit. They were kind yeah. of all over yeah. the place. There, there was no count for the psychologists on here, but they do fall under. That's my fault. I should have added that. There's three. Okay. And that has not changed. Thank you. So, as I mentioned before with our picture, we have the seeds. <laughs> now we're building our foundation, and it's like having nutrient rich soil for growth. <laughs> All right, where are we going developing our future? So, our program model we always need to have consistent review of programs and models. 
So you'll notice that faded out a little bit is assistant administrator of special education and a planning and teaching and learning coach. We need to revisit it. We need to see is it working, is it not working, and what do we need moving forward. Um, so I will be able to share some of that hopefully once we get our teaching and learning coach and, and see how that goes. Um, again, you'll notice I did mention that there was an error with the team chair. Um, our plan is to see how this model goes this year with our 8 through 12, our 4 through 7, and our PK through 3 with their partner school psychologists. And again, we're hoping, we've I've already talked to all the principals, we're hoping to have more discussions through the summer that I will have with them and for teacher involvement. So we're going to make sure that, again, that when we schedule students, it's planned, it's collaborative, it's purposeful, and it's ready to go. Our curriculum and instruction, again, we always are going to look at consistent review of curriculum and instruction. We need consistent feedback, supervision, and support. I feel that our teachers are working really hard, um, and I think that you know we need to also make sure that we're giving them the kind of feedback to recognize things are working, and also to say, what do we need to do to change some of the things that may not be working? Again, we're gonna focus on ex and expanding instructional methodologies, content, and strategies. We need consistent access to regular education programs, which again is happening this year. Consistent implementation of programs across. That's something we need to keep, uh, be very watchful of this year. <coughs> Our teachers teaching to fidelity. Consistent <coughs> use of data to drive instruction, both formal and informal. And also, when we're developing IEPs at those team meetings, we need to have data on the table. It's not what I think, what I feel. Consistent program access and implementation of visions, big ideas, empowering writers, novel and anthologies, just to say a few. Continuing on with the programs that I mentioned before and hopefully where it says writing program in italics, hopefully we'll have identified something to use. And again, those supplemental programs for our more substantial uh, students who need um, additional support. Our continuing of services is similar, but what we're looking at is an expansion of, an expansion, if you, if you go down, I, all the things are the same at the top but we want to expand we need to take a close look at our essentials program because we do have some students who may be moving up and we need to look at age age span is that going to work are our students still similar or do we need to split that classroom um, at BMR we're still looking at you know the same there but at the bottom we want to expand our content focused special education teacher model so next year our hope is again we're going to collect data to see how it goes with our K1 um, and our model in Millville to look to expand our maybe a 2-3 and a 4-5 so those grades could be connected so we could have again two teachers in grades two I mean one and two and one and three but they may be working together as more content focused specialists um, at the middle school, again, we're going to continue to look at how best, what models can work best because, again, we want our kids to be able to, you know, have the consistency um, for the content and inclusion. Again, it needs to be purposeful placement with support and specialized instruction. And that's the thing we're going to be talking more at our teams about. You know, what exactly is inclusion so everyone's on the same page? It's not someone who sits in class taking notes for students. It's not someone who's just pointing. It's actually instruction that's going on. Um, and as we move forward, um, we are committed in special education for the development and improvement of all of our practice and our programs for kids. And I really do believe with our focus, with the commitment, with the energy, and with my flower, a little bit of sunshine, mm -hmm. I do believe we'll achieve, and I guess you could say we'll bloom. Um, so we have staff that work very hard. And it's not all about working harder sometimes. We need to work smarter. I remember being as a team chairperson and we would sit around the table at the high school and the kids would come to the meeting. And a lot of time, sometimes the students were accused, well, you didn't study enough or you didn't study hard enough. And I will never forget sitting at a meeting and we had a student, it was just an initial evaluation and it came and it showed us that the student had some challenges visually, visual processing, um, visual spatial. And we'd say, well, how are you studying? Well, I look at my notes every night. I look at my book every night. And he was spending time doing that. But just to tweak that and say, you know what? Your listening comprehension is strong. You can, you, everything you hear, you absorb. Just tweaking what we're doing is what we need to do. 
that student didn't need to work harder. He needed to work smarter. He needed to find what was going to work for him. So in our district, we need to focus on what's going to work for us. So as we move forward, we need to focus and work smarter. And we're going to have a continued focus on building a district of one. As I told you before, I think it was last year, I really found that all of our schools, if you went in, you would never know we all belong to the Blackstone Millville Regional mm -hmm. School District. And I think we are not just one step, several steps closer to, to becoming that district of one. So some of the things I have on here, again, we have benchmarks, we have timelines, we have goals, but I want everyone to remember this is always ongoing and it's a never ending process. We always have to look at what's going on and reevaluate. We need to focus on consistency. We need to focus on providing constructive feedback. Um, again, supervision. I think our teachers, again, have been trying to do the best they can, but they haven't really been given a lot of direction and support. We need to use data to drive instruction, and like I said, formal and both for informal. We need collaboration amongst regular ed and special ed and special ed also to be able to collaborate, not only in their own grade level, but amongst grade levels. Same thing with our team chairs and school psychologists, to have that ongoing collaboration and regular collaboration. Our professional development needs to be focused, and our special ed teachers need to be part of that professional development and not be doing something separate all the time. We need those focused instructional practices. Again, I mentioned develop the IEPs that are data driven. Um, we need to make sure that all of our team chairs and our special education teachers have that knowledge about the special education process and eligibility. And as I said, our special education teachers I understand I went to school to be a special ed teacher, and we're masters of methodology. How do we do things? But what we need to focus on is also the content, and just to focus on, again, how all kids can learn. So finally, our final goal is, again, a district of one, 2,000 strong. Blooming. Blooming, blooming. Yes, really blooming. Any other questions for Bill? Jane. Oh. <laughs> um, excuse my voice, Jill. That's fine. Um, each slide has some inclusion um, piece to it. There's, there's certainly a difference between including and, and having a true co-teaching model. Mm -hmm. Is, is any of this reference to inclusion going towards a co-teaching model at any level? Do we, do we think we have the capability of getting there? I think we have the capability of doing anything. What we need to do is take a look at the, our staffing and make sure, because again, you know with co-teaching, it is more staffing if you want teachers in there doing co-teaching. However, what we're really trying to work on is making sure that our teachers have an opportunity at some point, say in the elementary, um, during the ELA, to be part of that ELA co-teaching along with that teacher. Same thing at the high school. When we do have a teacher who's included, um, we're, we try to make sure that they're specialized and there's co-teaching. We actually had an absolutely beautiful co-teaching model at the high school with one of our, our Eng two English teachers. It was a true co-teaching model. Would I like to work toward that? Yes, because when teachers are in the classroom, they should be teachers and not paraprofessionals. Indeed. Do we have any co-teaching right now? We do. We do have some teachers in the classroom. Would I say it's a true right now co-teaching model? No, we need work. The, the teachers are, are probably the teachers that are also doing the specialized instruction? Yes. Yeah, so if we have, say we have a, um, a, a fourth grade teacher and we have some students who require pullout, she'd be doing that pullout and she would also help support students within the classroom. But again, I, do I think it's a full integrated co-teaching model right now? No, I don't. I, I would describe it more as a supportive. You know, well, the, the, our teacher going in as the master of methodology and not as much as content. Anyone else? Right. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave that there. I don't want to touch the clicker. I don't know I'm going to <laughs> Thank you. Somebody else. Somebody, Somebody else. Click it. One quick question. More kind of for Dr. The 504 training that? Yes. That was that held on Tuesday? Uh, actually, we had to reschedule. So it's on the, is it this week or next week? 24th? So two weeks. And it will be everybody? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I know, you know, we spent a little bit of time on reviewing that, but I think it's important to just show that there is a, there is a trajectory that we're, 
Uh, one of the things that I appreciate about the way um, that Jill kind of laid out this piece about where we're going is there is a very kind of heavy emphasis on the reflective piece about what's working in terms of some of the things that we're trying this year. Um, one of the pieces that uh, is not included in here, and it, and it wouldn't be, um, and the committee will hear a bit more about this as we move forward through the year, um, is that we will have a new core literacy program. Um, that will really anchor all of the work we're doing K-12 and reading and writing. And so um, I just wanted to put that piece out there as we're starting to organize our committee structure and getting teachers on board um, to help us really go through that kind of reviewing research and piloting and selection process for that. Um, but that will be a really important piece. And, you know, we talked about before kind of the idea of this, this core work is like the hub and these other kind of, you know, these, these innovations, these other components are like the spokes kind of to the wheel. And so we'll be looking at kind of swapping out that hub, if you will, regarding our work with literacy and during this school year for an implementation of next year. And so there is, a, there is clearly, thanks, Jesse, there's clearly going to be a direct impact on, um, you know, how we work with our students with special needs, specifically around reading and writing. And so as we go through the trials, as uh, Jill mentioned, around the curriculum and instruction pillar of this work, um, know that we'll have kind of a different hub in there uh, as we move forward with that. Um, and so um, this certainly will not be the last update to the committee on this work. I know this is a major important piece of our work. We've talked a lot about equity issues in our district, and we've said repeatedly that this is our group of kids that we need to really be focusing, um, you know, in terms of really lifting these kiddos to where they need where they need to be uh, academically um, and so we will be hearing more from Jill as the year goes on and meeting our instructional coach for special ed when that individual comes on board so, all right so thank you for that um, shifting gears we're gonna just talk uh, briefly this evening and Donna would you mind just joining us at the table and mr. Dudek would you mind might come on down too um, I'm gonna go through a little bit about this process and idea behind portrait of a graduate for Blackstone Millville and kind of where this lives and what this means and why we're taking this on um, and how this is going to really help kind of complement if you will our blueprint for district improvement but uh, Donna and Mike are really the experts on this and are here to answer any questions that you might have as we work through this and just a quick kind of commercial on this piece. I know uh, the committee has met Donna a couple times and specifically in relation to work around personalized learning. And while we see that that's, that, you know, will, my sense is will ultimately probably be a part of this, uh, Donna has also done some really strong work in helping school communities get organized around. So what does all of this work actually mean for the student who gets their diploma in June in front of the high school and moves forward into <coughs> career or you know, community and, and how they're able to contribute successfully with that. So um, I know Donna wears many hats, but I just wanted to kind of shift gears and, and uh, explain that piece of it. And I also want to give uh, Donna and her organization uh, kind of a big shout out because they've worked really hard to make sure that we can do this. Um, as you can imagine, with any process, uh, there certainly is a, you know, a, a price tag that goes along with that and Donna and her team at base camp have worked super hard to make sure that um, that we can do this work at a very minimal minimal cost to the actual district um, and that's just because this is how passionate um, Donna and her team is about this and we're really grateful for that and excited for the opportunity and so uh, with that and just at, you know by all means jump in and ask questions as we move um, I won't sit and read this to you but essentially the gist of this work is we need to clearly define when we say that our students will be happy, healthy, proficient, ready for college, career, and community, that's a lot of words, but what does that mean? And we have to put some meat to that. And so this process will help us kind of walk through um, and define that. And, you know, Mike and I had a really great conversation about, you know, the, the timeliness of this. And so I think in some places, they've done this work. It's happened, it's in place, and they're, you know, they're kind of moving forward. Uh, and I feel as though that this is coming at just the right time for our district because as we finalize the roadmaps for the blueprint for district improvement you all saw the blueprint in the spring um, it's done as far as the actual strategy the objectives the initiatives the committee has seen those um, you know you're probably uh, tired of hearing about the mm -hmm. fidget spinner mm -hmm. um, it's, it's going to come it's up <laughs> it's it grown. is going to come in a different it's shape grown. later um, 
but um, but the idea is that you know all of this is going to lead to what and we're going to define that we're going to find what we mean by that through this process um, and so moving forward the, this kind of concept of that the why is more important than the what and you can see our two students student A student B uh, and you can see the really the different experience that um, that they're having and I have to tell you sitting at the ed hub on Tuesday evening with our students that are participating in that advanced manufacturing course they look like student B and one of the things the teacher said um, that just really resonated with me uh, was around um, and, and I'm gonna actually kind of quote him he said in front of the parents in front of the superintendents in front of the principals talk about pressure by the way right and the high school teacher from Uxbridge says to the students you know, there's certain things I have to teach you. There are competencies you need to know, but we're going to kind of throw all that out the window. He's like, I have this bucket of stuff that you need to figure out and learn, but you're all going to tell me what you want to do more of and less of. And I thought, that is, you talk about student ownership, right? We've got the set of competencies, you've got the standards, the things that the kids have to take on. But when you look at this student B and you talk about communication, collaboration, 21st century skills, and empowering the learner, that's what this teacher was able to do. Um, and I know, you know Mike was there with me, and the, the energy was just unbelievable uh, for late Tuesday you know, afternoon. And uh, again, we have five students of the 18 from Blackstone Millville, which is really awesome. And so that's the kind of experience that we want to get to um, in terms of really defining what this <coughs> ultimate <coughs> graduate looks like. And the why is because when we are really driving the work in the classroom and supporting our teachers and building professional learning, it all anchors back to this. This is the reason that we're doing A, B, and C. Uh, um, whether it's professional learning or giving feedback, um, et cetera. So, <coughs> um, and then just again, another visual, uh, you know, this is a great, it's not certainly a new cartoon, but it's a great one in terms of, you know, we, 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 for some reason, we tend to value a very particular, and I'm just saying the general we in education, a very particular type of student. And I will talk to you as a dad for a minute. I have one child who will do that work because he's a pleaser and he doesn't want to let anybody down. I have another child, <coughs> my oldest, but um, it's all right, who <laughs> intentionally, not identifying he will, <laughs> who will, it's, it's all right, it's my own, who he will not do that. He will absolutely not do that. He will not fall into line. He's going to do it his way. Uh, and, and, you know, unfortunately, we build a system <coughs> that really values that one type of learner. Well, what we are trying to do, I think the committee knows clearly in the community at this point, we're trying really hard to do this different because every single student matters. And there's more than, uh, you know, one way to get the work done. Um, and just a really quick anecdote, yesterday I spent the full day uh, in kindergarten and it was definitely the best day in the past 14 15 months that I've been here I think um, I had a really awesome uh, experience with the kids and with the teachers um, and we gave a math pretest this is like the perfect example of this cartoon and uh, the teacher was awesome she was very brave to kind of take this on and you know she and I were kind of processing before and she's like what do you think what is the best way to do this do you have any ideas and you know, we decided to just, like, just run it. Do it whole class, read the instructions, and let the kids, you know, kind of puzzle through it. And it was, it was the best example of this. It was hilarious because the students, right, so there was, it was an introduction to algebra in kindergarten. It was 8 plus blank equals 10, right? That, that's algebra, right? Find the missing variable. And these kids are five brilliant brilliant minds in our kindergarten so the directions were really anchored around like count the dots how many boxes have how many dots the kids had no <coughs> idea what the directions were saying but they could tell you that number was two because they know to get from eight to ten you have to add two more they got it right and, and some kids were able to count and some kids were using their fingers and some kids were drawing some kids they, they couldn't actually write a two but they said two, but they wrote an eight, but they knew it was a two, right? These are our youngest learners. So, you know, I, I really appreciated the teacher taking that on because it's a great example of let the kids wrestle with their learning and get to the answer the way they need to and show us that. Um, and, and some kids uh, actually didn't write anything. They just told us. Mm. And so we just kind of wrote it down and, or, or kind of wrote it on their paper next to what they were telling us. Um, and, and 
they get it and they're smart and they're you know the, the kids understand what they're what you know what they need to do we have to help them kind of show them that and allow them to get there how they need to and so part of this process will help us really define that very specifically and again I'm not going to sit here and read you know each month to you and, and and explain this process in great detail but you can see that there is a very clear plan on how we want to roll this work out um, and it is a you know referred to as a community team plan because as we'll see at the end of our um, um, to brief discussion it is a community team that's going to lead this work but I want to highlight just a couple things I think that are really important here um, and that that second bullet is this idea of kind of a needs assessment right so we ultimately will figure out where it is we want to go but we have to know where we're starting from and you know the committees you know no stranger to that we've read a lot of information and we've talked a lot about where we are um, and we're gonna we're gonna kind of revisit those those <clears throat> documents and revisit those conversations with this team but we actually want to take it a step further we're gonna visit some classrooms we're gonna get a really good sense with this community team of what's yes. happening in that classroom what does the teaching and learning look like um, and you know when we think about how do we get to student B over here you know how far away from that are we and what's the level of consistency with that and the change that needs to be brought forward and the support to help us get there and so again I won't read the whole timeline to you um, one of the pieces I just want to highlight in November is this just this idea of reviewing research right this we're not the first district to go through this there's a lot of information out there um, that we will we will be able to bring forward to the community team to help us kind of delve into those different 21st century skills what things we prioritize specifically around our purpose of happy healthy proficient college career and community ready and really help kind of spell out what um, those 21st century skills will be and, and then kind of backing that up again the work continues um, through January I think one of the things again that's hugely important is this idea of learning tours um, we need to get out of BMR we need to see what's going on in other places there are incredible things happening here uh, which you know I really want to underscore but there's cool things happening in other places too and there are other high schools and middle schools and elementary schools and district teams that are wrestling with the same stuff that we are um, and so yes context matters but it's also good to get out and see uh, some best practices and Aaron it, it has not been lost to me your question from last uh, late fall about personalized learning and summit and looking at school data that have been using it for a few years uh, and know that we'll have that information available to the committee to see this is not for the record I want to be very clear about this we're, at the end of this process we're not looking to buy adopt become part of necessarily anything it's helping us define what we want our kids to be able to do at the end of their experience with us yeah. again the the timeline for February and March and this is really as kind of laid out here this idea of moving portrait to practice and really helping us to start kind of <coughs> define you know what are the shifts that we need to make in order to put this in place and so you know I know the committee uh, very much subscribes to the same notion but when we think about the role of the committee and we think about you know policy and we think about budget making sure that we have all of those pieces in place to support the work right we always say that the fiscal plan needs to match the uh, the instructional plan and so that is very much ringing true with this piece of the work as well uh, and I just want to highlight we did try to switch up the fidget spinner a little mm -hmm. bit mm -hmm. but the idea is the that <laughs> right when you have your what your how the whole child the community that equals the graduate right when all of these pieces come together we should be able to have students move forward from our district um, and I know Eric who was here earlier one of our graduates you know is, is young and experienced in age but someday hopefully he will be the representative or he will be the senator or the governor fill in the blank right we want to make sure that our kids are ready for all of those opportunities um, we will have um, our community team out in the community talking to the public we will have them in front of the committee talking about here's what we learned here's what we heard here's what we saw here's what we think you know we need to do and what we can do and so we'll be having those presentations this will be a very public <coughs> conversation and then of course at the end of the year a celebration and plans for moving forward and so I want to be really kind of clear about this this process is not something different it's not 
you know, I don't want the uh, community or anyone to feel like here's one more, you know, kind of crazy thing the superintendent's dragging us through. This fits right into our blueprint. Mm -hmm. And this really helps us to define clearly the type of student that we want to produce from all of that work. And then the last piece is uh, the kind of stakeholder group that will um, make up the community. <coughs> And we will be looking for three school committee members to join us. Mm -hmm. um, so, with that. So, if you have interest in that, please let me know. Questions? So, we'll it seems daunting with all those dates up there. I, it's really not um, as daunting as it seemed. It, we were thinking of doing it right before the school committee meeting so that we'd have an opportunity to work with the community group, so the parents, the school committee members. Um, to kind of streamline your night so hopefully you'll you'll join us and there's just a couple of days in which you would be in the classrooms if possible and there's an opportunity for you to work with the teacher team as well um, that's doing some work at the middle school and the high school okay. I have a question um, so the the design team is that separate from the ILT teams or are we using the same groups as the ILT teams? Yeah, so we had we had that conversation actually Mike and I did uh, briefly and I you know it, it could it could work that there might be some overlap but there doesn't have to be mm -hmm. so we want to be really mindful of of that um, I think you know when you go back to that same well all the time that can be really daunting on the individual mm -hmm. however there is some cross-pollination that could be like or some kind of crosswalking from that work that could be really helpful too so I know as you know, Mike moves forward to look at that um, and who the staff, who might be the right fit for the staff, and putting it out there to them, there'll be some discussions around that. There could be some overlap, but there doesn't have to be. All right. I just the, the and I've shared this concern in the past, but I, I want the administrators as much as possible being in the buildings yes, as much we all as do. possible. Yeah. So I think you know, with the focus schools and then going out to um, see what's out there um, with portrait of a graduate, I think we need to be cognizant of just sure. having the administrators in their buildings. And um, I, I think we just I just want to put that out there. <laughs> Absolutely. I guess I, I'm, I'm processing what you just said, Jason, uh, slowly today. But um, if, if our goal is to use the coaches to develop the best practices and develop our, our blueprint um, as it develops, why, why would this team run separately? You know, I think we already run a lot of things separately. So I guess my concern is if we're saying that we need the coaches and the um, ILTs um, because we're, we're, we're everybody's doing splintered things, but then yet this is now going to be another sort of splinter. I'm, I'm I would challenge that, about thinking that. very respectfully, Tammy. No, that's I don't fine. I don't think we do things separately at all, actually. I think we are very much aligned and um, coherent and consistent. And, and the reason I say that is because um, we have such a small team. And I, Which you know, team are you talking about? So, so there's really one. There's a leadership team leadership for the district. Team. Okay. And each one of those members run their ILT, and that's it. That's what we have. But, so, but the ILT was developed because we were doing not every teacher was doing best practice yep that's right things that's what I'm talking about splintered there were splintered we just Jill just didn't use the word splintered but said everybody's doing their own thing mm -hmm. and we need to kind of come together to make consistent efforts in areas my question is does is is mm -hmm. the intent that of what the ILT team purpose is different than what this community team would be doing. I'm going to try to answer that sure, if sure. I can. Please. Because I see this as completely different. Mm -hmm. I don't see this as school based instructional. I see this as when we're talking in Blackstone Millville, these are the kind of people who are engaged <coughs> in our society, engaged in our community, engaged in their own education. And how do we get them there is the day-to-day the -day stuff that, you know, the teachers are about why we need to get them there. This is um, strategic planning, if you will, 
from an educational focus mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, you know, um, it's a new way, I think, of looking at our, at our mission. It's a new way of, look, of, of invigorating and, and generating some excitement in our communities about what education should be and needs to be so that we have graduates who are proud of themselves. Not that we're, I mean, we are proud of them regardless of what they do, but are proud of themselves, have a state. I mean, this, if you look at this, this is not, um, I mean, it's, yes, it's some teachers, but it's some students. I mean, I'd love to see a, a fourth grader or a fifth grader who has an opportunity to say, you know, and probably people aren't even thinking that way outside of the box, but has an opportunity to say, geez, you know, this is what I, I think school is for me, and this is how it can enhance my life. And I mean, there's some pretty smart fourth and fifth graders that we have and, and high school students, and, and this is bringing, you know, community members, this is bringing a, a big <coughs> focus to say, what is our vision? What is our mission? But not from a strategic vision and mission, but from a really global, why do we do what we do? So I love this. I'm wondering why the I, people from the ILT team aren't part of this. If we, if we are pushing forward, we've spent money on these coaches, we're saying that they ha they're bringing value to the educational process, whether it's project-based learning or not. Right. Um, why would it be a separate entity than our our vision for this group? That this is great. I love all these community members. I love all the the premise of that. My my question is not why do we have this group and not see the value of this group. Mm. My question is, if we are now spending a lot of money on on coaching and the development of best practice what's in here can be best practice and we're not saying it's separate so my question is why it, this is great why aren't we combining the two pieces of the yeah. vision I think it, don't, the ILTs would get us there aren't they telling us how to get so here so the instructional leadership teams let's let's define what they do first I think maybe that will help everybody kind of process through that piece of it. So the instructional leadership teams are school-based teams that are working with their principals to develop an instructional focus for each school, which you saw a couple in the spring, which are really anchored around problem solving. And that came from looking at student work. That came from looking at student data. Authentic, right, like the day-to-day -day work, and, uh, <coughs> and summative assessments, data assessments, internal assessments like STAR, those kinds of things. So the teachers in each of the schools worked with the ILT and their principals to really develop those instructional focus areas. What they're doing now is helping to come uh, to a place of a small set of instructional practices, like two to four instructional practices that they all commit to. And then with that, developing an internal accountability system so that we can see if those instructional practices are making a difference in student learning or not. And so, well, I would, I would agree completely that that work plugs into this, right? Because if we're talking about developing students' problem-solving skills and critical thinking skills, those anchor deeply into 21st century sure. skills. I was just going to say, if you look at the slide with the student, it says it right there. everything you right. just said right. lends itself right. to those four right. premises. And so my comment about the teaming piece and the alignment piece, you know, I, all I'm saying by that is I don't, I don't know that those, some of those folks won't be on this. Right. I, I, I'm not saying that they won't be. I guess what I'm saying is, I am, I am coming at this, and I know that Mr. Dudek is as well, from a place of kind of organic um, uh, engagement and authentic engagement in it and wanting to work with those folks that feel that they want to jump into this level of work. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what will not happen, I, I know for certain, is that we'll have an instructional leadership team that develops a focus on problem solving with these two to four skills, and this team comes out with something that's so left of center that it doesn't makes sense and that's where I reference that small team piece because when there's only a few of us you know I think there are seven of us in the leadership team we're all involved in every, all of it <laughs> so my, my notion on that was just that by that nature there is an embedded alignment that's going to just take place and may I please, please add um, so the work around the, the portrait of a graduate and then moving it into practice will actually uh, feed the ILTs and the coaches work going forward. So right now they're focusing on problem solving, but 
when this work is done, you're going to have a big picture of the competencies you want your graduates to leave the, your district with. And now the ILTs and the coaches can work to get the, the skills that they need into the classroom. So they'll play an important role in seeing it to practice. Right now, a lot of the work that is going to happen here is actually digging into what are those competencies that BMR students should graduate with. And then the ILT and the coaches will help to shape that going forward because they'll have the roadmap for the skills that they need to bring into the classrooms to meet those competencies. Anybody else? I just, uh, just one, yep. one take here. So I think in the years that I've been here, I've always been talking about what is teaching and learning look like, and I don't think that we've had a norm, norm definition of what that has been. So when Dr. DeFalco came to me and said, portrait of the graduate, I said, yeah, that's, that's, it's been on the plate for a lot of districts. We haven't tackled that yet, but I think this is a great platform for us to go and really examine so that when we have an eagle eye view of what our students should be by the time that they graduate and we're examining that in pre-k and kindergarten and fourth grade and seventh grade and ninth grade when we're talking about various best practices there's an there's a there's a and we ask the why question we know the answer to that because we have an end goal and in, for, for me we've been really struggling with or not struggling but tweaking what our student-friendly focus is. So at the high school, we're really talking about problem solving and or embedding critical thinking skills to um, develop proficient problem solvers. So now we're looking at what is that student-friendly focus that really encompasses all that. And for me, and this is something I've thrown out to staff and students, is for me, the end all, where do I want students to be in their educational journey? So when I look at it, at it this way, and this is just my personal view, I, looking, I look at it as we want students to stay curious. So they all come in, most likely to preschool, kindergarten, happy, excited, engaged, ready to go. And sometimes that curiosity diminishes. So we need to figure out what, how do we keep students curious? The other piece is thinking about just thinking critically. And that just ties in directly to what our student-friendly focus is, or our, our instructional focus. But at the end, I want students to be empowered. And to me, when I think about being empowered, those are lifelong learners. And it's not, I just finished high school, and I have my diploma, so let me just go and live the real world, or live in the real world. Or I have a student who goes to college, gets their four-year degree, and then doesn't think about how else they're going to be able to experience the world around them and discover it. So the portrait of the graduate, to me, it really helps transform what we're talking about, the why and the rationale behind it. And I'm really excited about getting into that work and looking at a team that truly encompasses K-12. Because I've been, you know, when we think about the NIESC accreditation, that was a high school committee. Looking at what our core values are and learning expectations, we're taking this to another level where we're saying this is a district of one, this is 2,000 strong, and we're going to really identify when students walk into the door as four, five-year-olds, what do they look like when they turn 18? Yep. And we're preparing them for a world and a career that we truly don't know about yet. Uh, but we're embedding those skills to have them be successful young adults in this community. So um, that was just my two cents on that. I just, I just want to piggyback on what Mike said. I, I really appreciate that he says the why. And I was looking at this and saying it really is all intertwined. We have the what, the how, the whole child, the community. This really is the why. And if we look at it from an instructional perspective, it's backwards design. When we have this full picture of exactly what we want that to look like, it helps guide the rest of the work to get there. So I really, I, I think that's great. That's that fifth piece is the why. So I just, um, Donna, if you could share with us, what does the learning core look like for, for this? 
So we would, a learning tool, we could decide as a group what you wanted to see. I think it would be really important to, to identify schools within your area that you want to see and maybe outside of it. Um, it's just a matter of where the conversation goes to see other schools that have done the project of a graduate work. Um, have you worked with any in our area to, to work on their portrait? Not in Massachusetts. Okay. But that's not saying, I mean, this is portrait of graduates been around for a while, so I'm sure we could identify quite a few schools who have done, uh, districts that have done this work. So that would be done uh, collaboratively with the group put together? The whole thing. I am I would just be the facilitator of the conversations, but it's actually your work, not, not mine. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All right, one more question. Uh, okay. <laughs> what uh, grade level, how low are you looking to go in the grade levels for the students? To, let me decide. I, I love what Jason said with kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, those, those kids can probably articulate their reasoning with how to solve a math yeah. problem. And yeah. Don't have to be they there every day. Hopefully, will demand teachers to teach them the way that they learn. And I would love for myself to engage with the first grader and ask them, "What does learning look like, yeah. and how do we best support you um, yeah. in that process?" And are you getting that um, right now? If the answer is no. We need to go and hit the reset button and start fresh. So I wonder, I, I love that idea as well. I think a first grader might have a hard time sitting through a two hour meeting before a student <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Probably not so bad time, but. I know sometimes <laughs> I have a hard time sitting through that, but I wonder if we think about how we, when we talk about bringing this back to the community, if we think about bringing this back to our schools and having conversations with our, even our youngest students about some of the things that we talked about. Like, you know, we really want people who graduate from kindergarten, from fifth grade, from 12th grade, to have these skills and kind of do some activities with them that show those skills in action. I think that would be kind of cool. Mm -hmm. It's so more of that learning walk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Getting the data. I think you had two amazing students right here yeah. mm -hmm. to be on that committee and inform all of you of what's, how, it's, how it's going. And th those two actually were in the focus groups for my uh, the entry work, and they are they helped shape our blueprint. Yeah, I mean they have the kids know a lot mm -hmm. about what we need to be doing different and what we do well. It'd also be interesting to think about students um, who have graduated from VMR and maybe had struggles afterwards. So, my son is now a college graduate, but when he first left high school and he was in that clique of kids who just did like your son and they did it all right and they knew how to do school, I was so surprised when um, the first Christmas break of freshman year, how many of his friends came back from their colleges and had dropped out and were going to CCRI, the community college, for the <laughs> following semester because they didn't they didn't have the skills that they needed to actually do the work. And then I think about like how and over the last four years, what path some of those children have taken. And I wonder if we had really committed in our town to graduating all students with certain competencies, if that would have been the case. And I, I think from my perspective, while I agree with you, a first grader probably couldn't sit through continued, continued meetings. I think sometimes we look to the best and the brightest and we pull those folks in and I think maybe sometimes we need to look for you know the wanderers who will surprise us mm -hmm. I, I, I margins, every yeah. single day am fascinated by the people who will step up when challenged mm -hmm. um, every single day I teach people who you know probably never thought they could sit in a classroom, but step up when challenged. And so for me personally, I'd like to see a really diverse, you know, not to make it on a whole student group, but a really, you know, the people we wouldn't normally pick, the person who's not a team captain, the person who's not a, you know, the, the 
conductor of the marching band or whatever you call the people who get the high spots. Mm -hmm. Well, and oh. correct, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm viewing this team as the team that's driving the work, not right. necessarily they're making the decisions. Obviously, they'd be gathering feedback from other sure, invested sure. parties. And it, maybe the first graders can come for a part of the meeting. They don't have to sit for, they don't have to sit for two hours. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I agree with you 100%, Jane. I think we could think about the number of students that we have on this as mm -hmm. well. I mean, that was nice and tidy to do three, sure. three, three. Sure, yeah. I think we could rethink mm -hmm. that as well. I'd actually like to take the feedback that you've given and play with the schedule a little bit to see how we can work some of these ideas in. We may have a really cool play date. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Anything else? Anyone? Okay. Thank well, thank you Thanks both. Thank you. Thank, thank you both. Includes my report. Okay. Um, again, I will repeat though. If somebody has particular interest in this, um, from a school committee perspective, <coughs> you know, we have several things on our plate and talked about those at our last workshop. But um, this will become a critical piece. So as is our regional agreement committee so please let me know and i think uh i always Aaron have Worth, the, i always next. have the pleasure of tying things up with the business report you do. <laughs> <laughs> um i will keep it brief this evening in fact this is really mainly an introduction of the reports that dr devalco and i are going to be using to present to the committee and also using to project where things are going with respect to the finances the first report that you have listed is the total revenue report it says fy20 revenue review at the top of it we found that uh, in the reports that we presented or i presented last year salaries were broken out and the revenues were not entirely covered based on grants that may not have been funded for or other sources of income that weren't funded for in the initial reports so this is every source of income that we envision coming into the district and it has every most of them as you can see have a budgeted amount and that will bring you to the total anticipated revenue which is in red um, kind of halfway through uh, that's the 24,789,123. Um, this, this document is live. However, there are going to be some changes that take place. I can tell you right now, in case anyone's looking, the collected year to date says nothing on the assessments, <laughs> and the towns <laughs> did pay their first bills. We just had, um, we've had some transition in the bookkeeping position, so that just needs to be updated. Um, and then on the bottom section there are revenues that we don't budget for because there's really no way of indicating how how much they'll be sure um, a, a question i would actually have for the committee is i have the school cafeteria revenue listed at the bottom after speaking with maureen uh, our new food service director we may put together a separate food service budget to present more regularly but it's actually not part of the school committee budget. Correct. So it, I think some of those t things get confusing when something's not part of it and we start looking at, well, what's the 24, you know, 711, how does this play in? It's $700,000 more. And it's, well, that was never really part of it. They have their own separate fund and budget. So, okay. Any questions on this revenue report? Great. Similarly, if you take a look at the expenditure review, um, this, this combines the salary review that we used to do and the expenditure by function. It has every single possible expenditure that we're going to have, um, what has been budgeted for it. If you take a look, write down the FY20 budget column, that's the number that we were looking at the 24,771,000. And that's where we're gonna keep tying our projections back to. Um, you will see a little bit of change in this document, even on the budget right now, because what I will say is, if you look at um, 
the 7,000 line, which is toward the bottom, mm -hmm. it says grant expenditures. I haven't had the opportunity to allocate. We haven't identified everything that we want to allocate towards the grants. So there are things that are budgeted in instructional supplies or in um, benefits that we're going to move to the grant line. So that will, that will show more expenditures from the grant and a little bit less expenditures from specific lines. But you'll notice that the total bottom line will never change. We do that because we weren't 100 percent sure of what the amounts were or what people sure. were returning and salaries to uh, account for. The other thing, um, if you are looking and getting very excited, it, the current available balance line says $3 million. Um, again, if you look, 573000 of that is from grants that we haven't expended, but we're going to expend that. Right. Um, another thing that contributes to that, if you look at the salary columns just mm -hmm. now, um, we have positions that haven't been filled. And so those, those uh, salaries haven't been encumbered because they're not appointed to specific people. So it, right now, the actual numbers are a little deceptive, but the focus should be on the budget, the process, and as we move forward, Dr. DeFalco and I will analyze it regularly and the projection column you'll see start to change. Just a question on that. Yeah. So if, if this person hasn't been hired, Am I to assume that there's a sub in the position, or is it not positions that are require subs? It, var it varies. So if it requires subs, are, are then the sub salaries encumbered in the sub line? The sub, the sub, line, sub salaries aren't encumbered because we don't really know how much they'll end up being. So depending on, these would more than likely be short-term substitute teachers because we're looking to fill these positions quickly. So we've budgeted a certain amount for subs, and that is, that's budgeted. Um, I'll try to. Well, it's over encumbered right now, so I right. just. That could, be, that could be part of it. <laughs> um, but does that account for the, the It may be some of the some of that, that yes, exactly. Okay. Some, of, some of that may get moved back to the regular salary line when okay. it, it becomes a normal teacher. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't realize that was over encumbered right now. It's a good point. <laughs> yeah, but it's I a like big red number for the first. It's only it's only a few. Of, it's only a few of them. No. Yeah, the one the well, four dollar one is the one that's. <laughs> <laughs> I think Vehicle we'll. I think we'll. $4 we'll get by. Get a discount. I'm four dollar sure discount. Like the red <laughs> I know. I'm sure it was. <laughs> tax. Tax. Well, and again, I, I would like to point out, too, if you notice the very bottom, even though there is a little, you know, we're focusing on these red numbers, which are n not which even over right. ten or $15,000. Mm -hmm. The two big ones that we struggled with last year were the 9,200 and the 9,300 right. lines, and that was because we never actually budgeted for what they were going to cost. We just said, we're going to offset them with circuit breaker, or we're going to offset them with a grant. But we never said what we were really going to spend. And now you can see, we plan on spending eight, almost $800,000 on you know, the non-public programs. And collaboratives are going to cost you know, $350,000. And those may change still, but as everyone knows, based on individual students moving in or out. Um, but that's why there is some. Uh, circuit breaker padding that, that's there. But are there any questions on the expenditure review? And you've also been given the personnel changes as of September 1st. There's very little change since the major report at the beginning of the year. And as always, we don't discuss these positions publicly. So if anyone has any questions or uh, needs more information, please just email me. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Is there anyone who has a school committee uh, forum issue they would like to bring up? Or I, I don't, it's uh -huh. not an issue. No, or you know, just, <laughs> just a <laughs> statement, comment. Yeah. Um, we actually have um, two, two people in the district that have recently retired, and um, I just want to recognize them. I know it was an off time. 
um, because they retired not at the end of the year. Um, so I just want to wish uh, Barbara Finn Campo Piano, who is a Title I, um, the Title I teacher at the complex. She's been there for a number of years. And also um, Karen Bro, who was the secretary at the AFM complex. Um, and I know that she will be definitely missed by my three boys. Um, and she's a big Red Sox fan. So we just want to wish them well um, in their retirement um, and all the best. When was her last day? Uh, I think it was first, last week. I think it was Friday. Friday. It was oh, last Friday. Friday. I'm, I'm not sure about. thing on Twitter, I think. Oh, they yeah. had a little yeah, thing. I'm not sure about Barbara Finn, but she's been there for yeah. quite, yeah. And you'll yeah. be here at the next meeting. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. Okay. That's it. That's all I have. Anybody else? School years have started well for everyone, and students are happy, right? <clears throat> I, I will just speak because um, I think <coughs> it has crept up on us. I just want to make sure everyone knows that the, the BMR Band Home Show is um, September 21st, and it is at 2 p.m. in Bellingham this year. Oh. In the past few years, we've been in Midway, mm. um, and I'm certain that the entire school committee as well as administrators are invited um, so if you need a ticket let me know and I will gladly get you your tickets. Is that two weeks? Is that it's two next weeks? Saturday. That's next yeah. Saturday. Yeah. And we don't have another meeting before that so um, it is moved up to 2 p.m. so they can finish before mm. the mosquitoes come out. <laughs> um, BMR always goes on last at their home show so they will probably be on around 4.30 ish is my guess. Um, if you're running late, you you can still catch them. And the show was phenomenal this year. So I hope to see you guys. I love the costumes. I've they seen are, pictures and, mm, man, the apples. Amazing. Amazing. The, the, the whole story. Yeah. What is the cool. story? You have to come Steal the September apple? 21st. <laughs> well, it's well take I listened. It's oh, called Take, take a, a Bite. bite. Okay. I and listened. the apple is, yeah. I mean, yeah, I not giving away the secret. Got it. So yeah. <laughs> the music is unbelievable. I mean, I've recorded them a few times, the a video, but I will just <coughs> actually turn it on and put my earphones in and not watch them, but listen to the mm. music. And wow. it's, yeah, Great. it's moving. <laughs> so I hope to see you there. All right. Um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn to move into executive session and adjourn adjourn the meeting from executive session so moved second okay, roll call yes 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 yes, yes. Yeah. all right our uh, next meeting is September 26th and there's a uh, regional agreement amendment committee I'm trying to not use the acronym um, <laughs> on the 25th right yes the Wednesday. <laughs> We're going to switch rooms. Mm -hmm.